league equivalent of a penalty in a red, a penalty in a yellow card. Yeah. Because well, you're giving him the chance to score again, versus a red card when it's just outside the box, but he was the last man because there's no chance to score now. From well, there's less chance to score now from the free kick. I think it's kind of the equivalent of that. If you if you get yeah. the drift, yeah. I think it was fair. I think that was fair, personally. Plus, the nature of the fence was very different to and all the, the, all the stuff they were, they were on yeah. team team warning for. And do you know what I noticed? And more so in this game than any other, and in particular, the player I noticed doing it the most was Dean Hadley, but I'm not just picking him out um, for the sake of it. I noticed him doing it a lot. And it probably led to a lot of these rook penalties and, and that sort of stuff that Hull got on a warning for. Um, grabbing, the, grabbing the opposition player's wrist... The wrist that's not holding the ball when they're getting up to play the ball. It did. I saw him do it on three or four occasions in this game, and I think I spotted it elsewhere um, in recent games as well, not just from him sort of thing. But that's the next. Maybe that's the next lying on. Yeah. Or so. So they're not going to hold the ball anymore because they know that's going to get spotted. But maybe if you just sort of knock away the non-playing unbalance them arm. Yeah, unbalance them, keep them locked in a bit tighter to you for a second than they want to so that they might knock on with the other hand because they're kind of stumbling a bit, that sort of stuff. And that was what the penalties were given for. So, you know, they were penalties. Yeah. Um, one other thing, on, on the Carlos try towards the end, the Talanoa pass, now that looked rather flat from the televisual angle. So no one's picked up on it, but to me that just looked like it was drifting flatwards. The knockback... From Talanoa. Yeah, from Kelly's kick. Yeah. I thought that was fine. I have no question marks over that, so... Yeah. Fair enough. Though. Interesting, like you say, other people didn't pick it up, which... May- maybe... Maybe I just didn't question it at all, yeah, may- maybe. But... Cracking leap, good good setup. I, I-, I think... I was happy with it. Uh... And it, you know, keeps gets Hull right back into the picture as well when we get onto the league standings later on. In terms of the stats, um, two key stats went to Hull FC's way in this game. Errors: 17 to seven, sorry, to 16, not 166 like I've written down <laughs> with my typo in the, in the rundown. Yeah, so seven by Hull FC and 16 by Leeds. So Leeds have themselves to blame for a, a failure of an execution there. And tries: four to three in favour of Hull FC. Obviously, Mark Sneed's missed conversions came up a bit, partly because it's such a surprise <laughs> that it happened the way it happened. Hull made fewer metres and breaks, but and gave up more penalties and had a 3.1 worse tackle success, but they took the win. So it was that huge error count in particular that swung things their way here. Um, individually, Sika Manu returned from injury, had an imposing game 148 metres. Scott Taylor, 125 metres. Danny Houghton, yeah, made his way to 46 tackles. And Albert Kelly with three try assists. On the losing lead side, Adam Cuthbertson, 144 metres and four successful offloads on his return from injury. Callum Watkins also went 144 metres, so another decent effort from the captain. Tom Briscoe, five tackle busts and 128 metres. When he did have the ball, he was able to contribute in that way. And Ryan Hall, one try and 113 metres for the world's biggest winger there. OK, um, Friday night now, there was three games. The first of which was... Well, it, it surprised me um, in, the, in the predictions. Salford 38, Wakefield 4. It was only 8-0 at half-time, so a second-half drubbing for Trin in front of only 2,686. James Child was the referee, and I'm sure performances like this will hopefully pad out that 2,600 for future games because it sounded like quite an exciting one, but the only fan review we got in was from a Wakefield fan. Yeah, it was Wakey White who said the first real pumping of the season for Wakey very disappointing after last week's heroics. I f- was feeling very confident before the game, but Salford dominated from start to finish, and we struggled to get any momentum or platform throughout, even though Louis went off early. Wearing with Cass up next, just hope the real Trinity turn up and not the wooden tops we saw on Friday night. I've not seen wooden tops. I can say, What's that mean? I don't know. I, I've not seen. I've only seen it as an expression for policemen. So I don't know what what coppers were doing there. Well, either way, uh, they were clearly ineffective. And yeah, even though it was only 8 0 at half time, the reviews I've read were basically that Salford were controlling things even at that stage and, and Wakefield couldn't get anything positive going together, really. And then in the second half, after Robert Louis had gone off injured, um, and, Tyrone, and there was a big switch. Yeah, around. Tyrone McCarthy taking over the kicking duties. 
which yeah, I didn't even know that was a a, a thing. Oh, I didn't did. know. <laughs> um, but yeah, a- absolutely quality all round second half performance by the looks of things from Salford. What what I noticed from the highlights um, that I saw was just they've, they've got that sort of wide ball movement going again. So maybe Little John's fitting into the patterns a bit more. Yeah. So the throwing passes that are missing out making missing out defenders which are then stripping teams for numbers and um if Sal can just continue being Sal on one and, in one centre and, and um, Ginger Pearl on the Chris other as well yeah. can sort of show some of the form he showed in the first sort of third of last year. Um they're gonna set up tries for the wingers, which is kind of what happened in the end here as as the game went on. Jake Bibby's in a really good run. I was just saying there, there's form. definitely a nice cutout ball to uh, to Bibby as well that he got on the end of which was a really nice move where they pulled that one wide. I think that was for his second try. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, and it sounds like there was good performances across the park from from Salford. Um, I, I don't have much more to add. And Do you have anything else you wanted to add before we go with the stats? No, nothing more on that. Just uh, it'd be interesting to see what effect the long-term uh, effect of if, if Louis is out any further. I haven't heard anything more about Batten, but if it'll be... A significant injury or something that will come back from. Well, I, I hear that maybe just as significant is Josh Wood picked up a knock too, I believe. So the down on hooking options and half options. So they'll want to be trying to extend Jake Shorrock's loan, I assume, even though he hasn't really been selected very often. Yeah, that's uh, it for me. So okay. in terms of the team stats, Salford were much better than Wakefield and all the numbers support it. More busts, breaks and offloads and six fewer errors 427 more metres and 1.8 metres per carry better average gain. They also had a 2.3% better team tackle success. So comprehensive, I think we would say. I think that there, is pretty individually. comprehensive, yeah. Uh, Jake Bibby, two tries, five tackle balls, 131 metres, two clean breaks. George Griffin playing in the second row in this one. One try, 42 tackles, 157 metres. Logan Tompkins was influential um, in both attack and defence. He went for two try assists and 49 tackles, 11 of which were marker tackles. Tyrone McCarthy, who, who you mentioned there for his goal kicking, also contributed a try, 109 metres. So it looks like that back row was very strong performing um, with Griffin, McCarthy and, and Flanagan in there for the Salford side. For for Wakefield, a couple of players popped in. It was the two centres, actually, because Bill Tibu stayed on the wing with... Um, Tom Johnston still out of the side, but Joe Arundel got a try in 107 metres and Riesling 108 metres. So they're the only guys who ticked any boxes for us from the Trinity side. Okay, the TV game um, on on Friday night was Wigan 28, Castleford 12 in front of 11,866 with Robert Hicks as the referee. It was 14-12 at half-time, but Wigan, as we know, are the second-half kings so far this season, and they pulled away to vict- to a comfortable, in the end, victory. Yes. So we've got some uh, views on this one. Starting off, uh, we'll give the warning out. So if you are listening with a child in the car, please turn your radio down right now. Uh, Fat Boy Rob... That's because Rob's going to... That's because we're reading out Rob's yes. views, not because of the swear word, no. no. Uh, Fat Boy Rob said, Robert fucking Hicks, what a useless ginger twat... This is the ginger racism you picked up on earlier. Uh, You shouldn't be allowed to ref a school game. Never mind the Pies versus Champions of Europe. (laughs) Sorry, (laughs) that was involuntary response. Uh, Now I have that out of my system onto the match. Wigan were good and Cass very poor. Webster had a stinker. Cass dropped the ball and Ratboy looked class. On tonight's performance, he could catch the clap of a bird in the third row. He was that good. Oh, okay, I've reread that in a different way. Uh, Scoreline flattered. Cass. There we go. That was Rob's view. Okay. Um, Carsten said, except the last 10 minutes of the first half, it was Wigan all over, but the game left some questions open. Can't the players handle a dry ball anymore? Did the transplants influence Luke Gale's game intelligence? Is Ollie Holmes a better radio host or rugby <sighs> player? Hashtag just asking. Jokes aside, Cass has problems all over the park. Defence and offence were not top four worthy. Yeah, at White Pie, the uh, the Wigan... Just, sorry, so, yeah. just an aside on Ollie Holmes' uh, radio show on Proper Sport, which I think it's on either a Tuesday or a Wednesday at about tea time. Anyway, um, last week's, there was a really interesting bit about why Jai Hitchcock's had to go on loan 
to Bradford. So it's worth checking out for that if you, you know, there you go. download the proper sports um, app and or whatever. Go on their website and find the the back catalogue from last week and listen to that. Fair enough. I shall be uh, checking that one out at White Pie. The, uh, the Wigan fan and, of course, Brentford supporter, most importantly, said... Uh, f- is that him? Or was that someone else? Am I confused? Him I don't... He, he, he is originally from down south, I'm, I'm pretty sure. So uh, I'm sure he'll correct us, if not. So I, I don't know who his football I'm, I'm, um, tendencies lean towards because I don't, yeah. don't really care. <laughs> There's someone who's a Wigan fan and a Brentford fan, and I can never remember who it is. Anyway, it said, uh, finally, a game where Wigan could actually be asked to show up in the first half. A couple of dumb penalties got Cass back in the game, but the Golden Edge did the business again. The pack dominated Cass up front and denied Gale the chance to control the game, which meant he was rattled and spat the dummy. Easily our best 80 minutes of the season. Uh, Mitchell Dart said, It was worth the wait. Try on debut and the Super League experience is the wonder that is Gary Lowe. Hashtag lo and behold. <clears throat> I'm surprised we haven't had a swing low or something similar. Um, finally on the feedback, Chris Christmas said uh, to beat the champions is always difficult to so then follow up with beating last year's league leaders is also nice <laughs> <laughs> good work Chris uh, review of the I think from quite, quite quite comfortably <laughs> uh, Cass were out Moores and Senna Lafeo and it allowed the Wigan pack to bully them and therefore control the game for all but the 10 minutes at the end of the first half still think we're going to have improvement in them so if we can avoid major injuries it bodes well for the rest of the year uh, yeah Cass showed what they can do, which is score quick tries back to back if you give them the field position and opportunity. And with the errors that Wigan were making and the penalties that Wigan were conceding, um, you know, all their own fault, pretty much. Uh, I would say that 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 did come off the back of of that. Um, but for the rest of the game, even though the errors and penalties were still existent. Um, Wigan were were miles miles better than Castleford across the park. I'd say Wigan's worst player played to the same standard as Castleford's best player. Mm. That was the difference between the two sides. I'm, I was Cass were flattered by the scoreline, like like Rob said. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, certainly uh, Burgess, as we mentioned earlier in in the news, had a uh, or the teams had a had a brilliant game and really showed some of those breaks were again what he, what he can do and when he really opened those legs that was quite something he was really pinging around um, particularly Gildot's second try where he, he got cut off from the from yeah. the side and, and threw that offload uh, back inside I think that, that was exceptional but yeah um, Wigan in the post-match have talked a lot about the tackle one and tackle two plays and um, and they really did strip Castleford with those plays in this game so so it was really impressive to see attacking from the moment they got the ball and um, some people have been slagging Wigan in, in the last few years and often rightly so but when they're doing that sort of stuff spreading it wide straight away to try and attack from the from the get-go you've got to say that there's a change in style a change in mentality this year um, which is great and, and Sam Tompkins was a huge part of that but um, I think across the board players contributed to that the only thing that really let us down in a way was our in-game kicking kind of kicking for distance in the sets that we didn't work that hard on but um our physicality in the game chris touched on it but wigan basically after the first three or four sets won almost every collision on on the pitch apart from the set after apart from the set after cass scored their first try when they were Trying to get him quick play of the balls and piggybacked up the field off the penalties off the back of those. But other than that, Wigan won almost every collision um, and, and in defence pushed them back a yard or two. I think uh, John Wells highlighted it in his recap when I watched the game back, but it was quite late by the time I watched it back. So I can't remember exactly, but I'm pretty sure he recapped that as the game breaker um, was Wigan's kind of the way the defence physically controlled and pushed back and, and legitimately slowed down the ruck just by more physically imposing than their opposition. I, I'd say that they were the most exciting signs from me as a Wigan fan. I think game. one of the things that I, I picked up on was uh, John Bateman really zipping about the centre, something that is not done as much of. And in, it's sort of, there's been some criticism of when he has played at centre, which I don't think is justified necessarily. But I think he definitely looked very much like he was in the mould in this one and he was really on form. Yeah, I mean, the, the, 
one of the main criticisms is he doesn't do anything for his winger even more so when he's on the right side in the centre rather than the left side in the centre I feel he doesn't do a great